All right, I will take that as my cue to get started. Um, really excited to be talking to you tonight about the Clovers of California. Um, I'm Andrea Williams. I'm the Director of Biodiversity Initiatives for the California Native Plant Society. And when we planned this webinar, we didn't realize that it was on St. Patrick's Day. But here we are. My cat is very excited about it. Um, he came in to tell me that his eyes are green, so I don't need to pinch him. Um, the clovers that I have up on the screen right now are the most seen and least observed in our um, 2020 fire followers. So I'm going to be focusing mostly on the species that were found there, which is really most of the clovers in California. Um, I have a 20 plus year history in land management and plant ID and really got into clovers in the 10 years that I was out in Marin. Um, working out at Point Reyes and also on the, um, the Marin Municipal Water District up on Mount Tam. So they have around 40-ish species of clover um, or types of clover in Marin County and I got to know them all really well and some tips and tricks for telling them apart pretty quickly, um, not just on my own, but through the, the mentorship of, of the great folks um, at the chapter, the Marin chapter of CNPS, especially um, Doreen Smith. Um, so I am going to go ahead and get started with this. So we're going to talk about some clover parts and key features. Um, flowers always really great to look at in identifying plants. Clovers are no different. Um, some of the specific things in Trifolium, um, which is the clover genus, are the flowers, number of flowers, color of flowers, and then the banner and wings that we're going to be looking at a little more specifically. Um, the calyx, the lobes to tube ratio, and then the calyx to flower lengths. And, and I'll have some specific pictures that go over what I'm talking about when I mention these things. And then the inflorescence overall, um, where are the bracts, what do they look like, where are the hairs, um, and then how long are the pedicels and things like that. And then we'll talk a little bit about all of the clovers and putting these in kind of some, some groups, understanding those relationships, noticing the little things, and then a few of the online pieces, um, ways to get help um, either from people or computers. And um, the databases are most often connected to folks and I am present, I'm omnipresent in these plant identification places because I love to identify plants, particularly um, random plants from pictures. Um, and I probably shouldn't say that out loud, <laughs> but there it is. And then putting it all together, so recreating responsibly, and then a couple of programs that we have going right now, community science programs that will help you kind of dig deeper, go out um, and do some plant observing um, for the betterment of overall knowledge. So as always, when you are starting to identify groups of species, be they birds or plants or mammals, um, you really, or insects or fungi, you want to learn kind of the common species, the, the species that you see all the time and every day, um, as luck would have it. The common clovers um, that we're going to talk about today really do represent kind of major breakpoints in the key. And I will be talking a little bit about the Jepson E. flora key, but also some things that will um, that will help you identify clovers even if you don't want to go through the key. So it's kind of um, a little bit for everybody tonight. And then once you feel like you know those common species really well, you start to learn the features that you need to look at to tell those common species from others. And that's going to be important if you are trying to use a, a dichotomous key to identify species or if you have a field book or, um, or a website that mostly just has pictures. So you know what to look for when you're trying to tell these species apart. Um, some of the big things are habit and habitat, and that includes bloom periods. So habit is what is the growth form. So some of these clovers are a single upright stalk. Some of them are spready and mat forming. Um, some of them are perennial, some of them are annual. Um, and then habitat, a lot of these uh, species grow in meadows or wet meadows, but some of them can be found in rocky or drier habitats. Some of them are creekside, and that often also influences bloom period. 
um, inflorescence and leaf characteristics, which we'll talk a lot about. And then a lot of these clovers have some interesting post bloom or textural features that do play into, um, into what makes them the, the taxon that they are. So, how do you get some sort of corroboration um, or help with identification? And, and the ways to do that are taking pictures and uploading your observations. And there are a couple of public websites that are really great at helping to get your plants identified. And those are Calflora and iNaturalist. And I'll talk a little bit about both of those. When you're taking pictures, it's great to give a sense of scale with a hand or a ruler or a coin. Um, and then also note things that aren't capturable in photos. So if there are other species around um, that are a different phenology, sometimes you can take multiple photos and put them into one observation, um, or sometimes they may have a smell or a texture that doesn't really come across very well, or it's hard to capture in photos. And then I am um, a lazy and suspicious person, and I carry that into my plant identification. So I will look at the suggestions that are offered by websites or other folks, but then I'll double check those against um, what are the features that should be present and do I see those features? And when I was first getting started in plant identification way back in college, back in the last century, um, I did a lot of sketching and sketching is actually a really great way to understand plants and really get an eye for detail because you are looking really closely to make sure that you are capturing all of the detail of these species. And so I, I do wanna offer that. It's a little less shareable, but it is um, you know, keeping kind of a, a naturalist notebook is a great way to get to know plants as well. So I wanna back up a little bit beyond clovers and talk about the family that they're in, which is the Fabaceae. And these are um, kind of organized into three subfamilies united by their fruits of beans. Um, so the mimosa subfamily, the flowers are, are very, very different um, than say the red bud subfamily and the leaves are very different. So the leaves in the mimosa subfamily, um, pinnate um, compound leaves. And mostly when I think of them, because I'm in Northern California, I think of non-native acacias, but down in the drier areas of the state, native mesquite and fairy dusters um, will grow there. And then the red buds, you know, they have kind of that more traditional pea family flower, um, but their leaves are simple. And you see these very often in landscaping. A lot of folks will plant Eastern red bud, but Western red bud is a great landscape plant as well. And then um, two kind of, this is the pea subfamily, but I divided them up into the plants whose compound leaves end in a tendril, which are the, the sweet peas and vetches. Um, the um, Lathyrus and Vichia, and then over in the leaflet division, lupins, clovers, milk vetches, lotus, and indigo bush. Very broadly, lupins and clovers have palmately compound leaves and others pinnately compound. That doesn't always hold, and we'll, we'll find that out a little bit later. Um, so we have a little bit more of an illustration of what I mean when I say a compound leaf and a pinnately compound leaf. So this whole thing is a leaf and when it's pinnately compound, pinna is feather. So it's got this central axis called a rachis and then the leaflets are on either side of these. This one ends in a leaflet, whereas in this, you know, ends in a bristle or tendril. And then this is alfalfa, um, this is actually pinnately compound as well. In the palmately compound, um, they'll all come out from a, the same central point, and this actually has a little continuation of the axis. I think it's quibbling, but you know, I didn't write the key. So um, these are all pinnately compound, and most of the clovers are, um, these are all pinnately compound, most of the clovers are palmately compound. A little more about the um, flower characteristics. So the pea family has, you know, what are called irregular flowers. You think of them as pea flowers. This upright part is the banner. And then these two side petals are the wings. And the central boat-shaped thing is the keel. You hardly ever see the keel 
in um, clovers, and they're really not use, used in identification hardly at all. It's mostly I use the banner and the wings a lot. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in lupins. However, the keel is very important in identification. And the other thing about clovers is you don't generally think of them as having legumes. You don't really see their, their pods very much, but they are, they are there. So let's talk a little bit more about flowers, the number, shape, and coloration of flowers. And when I say flowers, this gets back to my laziness because a flower is actually made up of two parts. Um, this colorful part um, called the corolla, and then the lobes down here called the calyx. Um, and so the petals together form the corolla, um, and then the calyx down here, these bracts that are, um, that are fused in, um, in clovers. So normally when I say flower, I could be talking about the whole thing, or usually I'm just talking about the corolla part of it. If it's confusing, let me know. Um, I think you'll be able to follow along. So Trifolium monanthum here, um, very few flowers. That is a characteristic of it. Um, mostly white, but you can see down here in between these wings that there's a little bit of purplish coloration. And sometimes these will have um, some violet striations as well or striping. And um, it's also good to know what clovers have variable coloration in their flowers and which ones don't. Um, Trifolium monanthum does. It doesn't vary in the number of flowers though. Trifolium wildenovii or tomcat clover. This is really our most common native clover and I'm gonna talk about it a lot because learning common species, that's a great way to start. Um, this usually has this pink banner and the wings are purple at the base and white at the tip. Um, and then it's really variable in the number of flowers that it has, and slightly variable in the coloration of flowers. Um, but also want to note, you know, this has a little heart shape to its banner, and this banner is notched, but mostly pointed. And then you go over here to Trifolium hurtum, which is our most observed non-native clover, and really one of the most non-native, most common non-native clovers in California. You can see how long the banner is on this species and how thin it is. And that's actually also another good way to tell. There are a lot of ways to tell Trifolium hurtum from other clovers. And then this is a species that, that gets um, misidentified a lot in that people think that they're seeing it when they're really not. And this is Trifolium wormskeldii. It's one of our perennial clovers, grows in creeks, um, Uniform, not uniformly pink, but um, deeper pink at the base, lighter pink at the tips. Um, some people will think that Trifolium hurtum is Trifolium wormskeldii or Trifolium wildenovii is Trifolium wormskeldii. Um, and it's not, it's actually not that common. It's got a really big head um, and that creek habit or habitat is, um, is one of the key features of it as well. So let's talk a little bit more about the calyx. And these are four really great examples of different calyx types in trifolium. Um, the length and ratio of the lobes to the tube and then the calyx to the flower lengths um, are all really important in clovers. And so this one over here, this is one of the trifolium alloperpureum group and we'll get into them near the end. It's actually really complicated because they used to all be considered one thing, Trifolium allopurpureum, and then more and more species got split off of them. Um, kind of similarly to Trifolium variegatum, it used to just be, oh, it's Trifolium variegatum and it's super variable. And then you come to realize they're actually separate species and they get split out as well. So um, clover is tremendously variable um, and it's great to learn how to tell them apart. So with this group, it's the, they all have these plumose calyx lobes, but then how large this flower is in relation to those calyx lobes, it's very important. Um, this is Trifolium ciliolatum tree clover. Um, the really important thing here are the bristles along the edge, and that's what cilia are. So if you think way back, 
like grade school, if you ever like drew the parent, you looked at the paramecium and the microscope and you drew it and you did all those lines, all those lines around the edge, those are cilia. Um, and cilia latum has those, the other clovers don't. Sometimes hairs will look like cilia, but you have to like look really closely um, and tell that this, these are actually those hard white bristles and not hairs. Um, Trifolium barbigerum, another one with uh, kind of an interesting look to the calyx lobes, much longer um, and, you know, gives it this bearded look, which is why it's called bearded clover, along with this really big involucre. And we'll talk more about this clover as well. We're not going to talk a lot more about this clover. This is Trifolium obtuse something. I always forget because I just call it clammy clover. I see this glandular calyx. And I know that's what it is. It also tends to have these flowers that are really big and also much, much longer than the head. Um, so you see the calyx lobes and the involucre down below also really cut. So it's got this like sticky, really bristly, lobey look to it. And then the pale flowers with that purple spot where the banner kind of reflexes back. Obtusiflorum, thank you. I don't think the flowers look very obtuse, but I don't think anything about it looks obtuse. I think it's very acute. Um, all right, bracts, hairs, and pedicels. So clover parts, key features, inflorescence. So this is where we're kind of looking um, mostly at the involucre here. Um, this is Trifolium microdon and Trifolium microcephalum. They don't actually look anything alike, but I always have to pause because they both start with micro and they have pink flowers and I have to think about it for a second. So this is thimble clover. You can see the shape of the involucre um, really key in this species and then kind of these little pink flowers that extend well beyond the calyx lobes and then, and no hairs. And then you look at microdon, super hairy, um, super bristly calyx lobes, and then this involucre here that's more of a flat dish. Um, flowers don't tend to extend beyond those calyx lobes. And then this is Trifolium bifidum, um, decipiens, deceptive clover. Um, there's two types of it. These, um, no involucre and the flowers reflex, so they bend back towards the base. Um, this one, there's very often, you'll see this fuzziness around the pedestal, and that really quickly um, breaks it from ciliolatum, which superficially looks like it. Um, and then the leaflets are another way to tell them apart. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And this is, again, trifolium hurtum. This looks like an involucre, but it's actually the stipules from this leaf here. And there are a couple of species that will do that, that will have the flowering head sitting right atop this leaf. And so this is not an involucre. Those are stipules. So that's an important thing to know when you have that key break and you're choosing between group one and group two um, and having to, to make that choice. I promised I would talk a lot about tomcat clover and I'm going to. Um, it's kind of one of my favorite clovers. I think it's very stylish. I love the linear leaflets. Not a lot of clovers have that. I love the big flowers. I love the color variation. I love the striped calyx. It's a really cool clover and I'm glad that it's super common. There are over 80 kinds of clover in California, and over 60 of them are native, and there are 15 rare types. Only five kinds of them, or species, have more than three spe more than three leaflets. And so three leaflets, pretty good idea you're going to have a clover. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. And then um, we're not going to really talk about the clovers with more than three leaflets, because they're not that common. Um, but if you're a little stumped as to what something is and it's got more than three leaflets, check out those species in the key or on, on one of the websites. Um, tomcat clover, bracts fused below the inflorescence, so this involucral wheel here. Um, kind of distinctive patterning of lobes on the calyx. Um, very often you'll see this kind of overall stripey look. They will have these um, these lobes here, sometimes they have that double toothed, but not always, but that is good to know. 
Um, this clover is kind of the, the standard clover for group one with the blue black bracts fused into a wheel. And I'll talk a little bit more about those, the color wheel clovers, um, where you have this, this um, fused bracts kind of forming a wheel. They're not super big and they're not gonna be um, covering the clovers when they're pressed. Um, so the bracts, not that, the involute are not that big. Um, you can see here in another picture of Wildenovii, it's got the pink on the banner, the purple at the base of the wings, the white at the tips of the wings. Um, that combination with the linear leaflets and that toothed wheel um, should lead you to Wildenovii every time. Um, somewhat similar variegatum, particularly two of the subs two of the varieties. Um, I think of them as kind of like the schnauzers. You have the standard um, variegated clover, which is variegatum variegatum, which is pictured here. Um, it's the number and size of flowers. And then variegatum major, which is larger. That's the giant schnauzer variegated clover. Um, they're both like tomcat, but really notice the coloring on these on these flowers. So pinkish purple at the base and that strong white tipping. That immediately distinguishes it. And then also the lobing on the calyx. The lobes here are longer than the tube and here they are not, they're shorter than the tube. Um, the leaflets are another way that you can tell these apart pretty quickly. And then there's um, the miniature schnauzer clover um, small flower variegated, which is Geminiflorum. Many fewer flowers, um, but retains that like long lobe to tube and then involucral wheel that's um, relatively well cut, but looks a lot like few flowered clover. So a lot of times you'll be asked how many flowers one of your clovers has, and there are a few of them that have very few flowers. Geminiflorum, oliganthum are two of those. And they're the ones that have in blue curl wheels and um, coloration in the flowers. But if you look at the coloration of oliganthum, you'll notice it's really much more similar to tomcat clover. Sorry. It's excitement time in the house. Um, so flower size and number do differ. And then the Involucre is cut much more deeply in oliganthum than it is in wildenovii. There are a lot of other um, clovers in this section of the key that I'm not gonna talk about. Um, I talked a little bit about cow clover already, siskiyou kind of similar in that they're large headed. So like lots of big flowers and they're perennial and they're in wet meadows. Um, Clammy clover, I talked a little bit about another, another one that is in wet areas, that glandular bumpy calyx, those long toothed flowers, and leaflets with really long teeth as well. And then there are a couple of narrow endemics, Monterey and Pacific Grove clover, that you might see if you're down there, but if you're anywhere else in the state, you're probably not going to see them. Inflation, inflation is on everyone's mind right now. So let's talk about inflation in the clovers. Um, bull clover, one of my favorite, it's, you know, I gotta stop saying that. One of my favorite clovers, I love bull clover. It can be a little different to tell bull clover from cow bag clover um, in a photo. One of the main distinguishers is size, um, particularly flower size. If you can see the underside, um, the involucre is, is different. Um, but overall, they can look really similar. They grow in similar places. Um, sometimes the color is helpful. Bull clover is very often pale yellow, or it will have a really pale cream color with dark spots um, right around the, the base of the wings here. Um, there are two forms, coastal and inland, that are not formally recognized. That may change over time. Um, and then cow bag clover, trifolium depoparatum, really similar, much smaller. Um, the flowers are usually purplish with white tips, but not always. And then sometimes they're paler, um, particularly in some of the varieties. There are three varieties and they differ mostly in the involucre. So um, some of them are just like a really faint ring. Some of them are larger. 
Um, the leaflets in cow bag are usually longer than wide. Um, and then in fucatum, they're about the same length as they are width. Um, something that looks a little bit like cow bag clover um, is saline clover, very similar to the popperatum, but it's found in salt marshes and alkaline soils very often, well, not very often because it's rare, in the Central Valley. So it's got a really small involucral ring, which is similar to one of the varieties of cow bag clover. Um, but note these striations on the inflated flowers here. Um, woolly clover, tomentosum, probably my favorite non-native clover, because um, look at those fuzzy brains, I dig them. Um, bull and cowbag clover, they'll have inflated flowers. Um, woolly clover is an inflated calyx. Um, strawberry clovers, um, Trifolium frugiferum is similar, but not that inflated. The, the heads tend to be on a stalk like these guys and um, they'll be fuzzy and inflated, but it looks more like, kind of looks more like a strawberry. Um, and then the, the calyx in woolly clover becomes more prominent as the flowers wither and reflex. And so if you see it in flower, you can kind of see it in the background here. It just looks like it's got a super fuzzy calyx and the flowers are kind of inconspicuous and white. It'll grow in low mats. Um, it's a non-native that's often in disturbed areas, but I've seen it growing um, in clearings and serpentine as well. Um, so it really just, uh, it just kind of depends. So be on the lookout for that one. Um, flowering saucers. So this is where we start to get into um, where the involucre is more important in identification. So um, Trifolium microdon, why? Oh my God, what a beast. All right, that was Loki. Um, so Trifolium microdon, Trifolium microdon, thimble clover, I usually call it cupcake clover and a lot of other people do because the involucre looks like a little paper liner and the flowers look like a pink frosted top. Um, they are small, like small headed clover, but the calyx lobes aren't bristle tipped. You can see the flowers pretty clearly Whereas in microcephalum, small headed clover, um, you really can't see the flowers. Like this is it in full flower and you can barely see them. There's this fuzzy dish down below the flowers, overall bristly. The calyx lobes themselves are bristle tipped and the plant overall is, is wavy hairy. And this one, not at all hairy. Um, bearded clover, barbigerum. Um, the flowers on this, you can see, again, this bristle-tipped calyx lobe, the flowers rarely exceeding it, so the, the corolla is kind of at that same level. Um, they're often plumose, which, again, like a feather. The involucre is larger than in gray eye, um, and the lower part of the banner is often inflated and free. So I didn't include this in the, um, in the inflation because this is really in with those like clovers with honkin and velucers. Um, these are the four ones that you need to watch for. And these, you know, like you might confuse these two, you will probably confuse these two because they used to be, um, Gray's clover used to be considered a variety of barbiturum and um, has been split out. It's mostly by flower color actually. So much like the bearded lar um, larger flowers, they're strongly white tipped and they will extend beyond the calyx. Um, there are some folks I think who still consider um, Gray's clover to be Trifolium barbigerum and Drusii. Um, there are a few other clovers in this section, which is section six of the Trifolium key and the E flora, um, bowl clover, Trifolium sciathiferum, which, which has deep bowl shaped involucre. The flowers are kind of nondescript, and the calyx lobes have these forked bristle tips which are not plumose, they're um, much less fluffy, um, much more bristly. And then another couple of narrow endemics, uh, Santa Cruz clover, and I'll talk a little bit actually about Butte County, um, golden flowered Butte County clover later. Oh, reflection, let's take a moment to reflect. It's not really reflect, it's reflex. 
Um, this is where we start to get into clovers without involucres. Um, and generally, if you have uh, flowers that reflex or bend back towards the base of the plant, you're not going to have an involucre because that would just get in the way. Why would you do that? Um, tree clover, ciliolatum. Uh, the flowers will start pink. We saw a version of it earlier. Um, you can really see clearly here these hooked, these sharp bristles on the edges of the calyx. Um, really visible when the flowers start to fade because the, um, the calyx lobes will spray, splay out. The leaflets are truncate to rounded, which is different um, from pinpoint clover and notch leaf clover. So that's another way that you can tell them apart if you don't um, manage to take a good photo or you can't quite tell, um, make sure that you're taking a photo of the flowers and the leaves because as you can see in this photo of notch leaf clover, it kind of looks like there are bristles along the margin. And so if you have a hairy calyx, sometimes it looks like maybe you've got cilia there. Um, so another way to tell is to look at the width of the calyx lobes. They're, um, they're thin throughout. And then the, the leaflets are a dead giveaway for notch leaf, um, particularly if you have variety bifidum. They're deeply notched, so up to halfway, um, these really narrow, deep hearts, and very often they'll have some white chevroning or purple coloration on the leaflets as well. Um, they are shallowly um, notched in decipians and deceptive clover because um, it's like, I'm bifid, no, I'm not, so I'm going to deceive you. So pinpoint clover, um, I have trouble with this one because I hardly have ever seen it. Oh, the other thing about bifidum I mentioned earlier, the hairs below the inflorescence, not present in pinpoint. Um, generally, the flower color will help you tell these apart from ciliolatum or from tree clover and notch leaf clover. Um, these tend to be kind of a deeper pinkish purple with paler tips, but there is um, a really cool looking deep purple version in the East Bay. When the flowers reflect, they very often turn to one side and you can kind of see that in these two right here. Um, the pinpoint calyx, usually hairless and the lobes are broader at the base, you know, 0.5 millimeters versus 0.2 millimeters, but you do definitely see that tapering when you look up close. Um, and when you look up close, you'll also see, you should also see no hairs. Um, the leaves again are often white with, uh, often with white or purple patterning, similar to notch leaf, but the, um, the shape of the leaves is very different. So these are you know, what you would think of as clover leaves, right? I included bolanderi among the many other rare um, reflexed clovers because it was actually seen in our fire followers areas. Um, the flowers are pale. The calyx is this really stylish purple black, not to be too like editorial about it. Um, this is one of the hairless perennial clovers. Um, it's a rare Sierran clover. There is um, a non-native Rasputinatum reversed clover. It looks kind of like upside down flowers. So the banner appears to be underneath, even though that's not the case. Um, there's the De Decker's clover in Southern Sierra. That's got pale, pale flowers with linear leaflets. Beckwith's clover um, from far Northeastern California, that's large with pink flowers. And then there is um, productum, productive clover that's fairly similar to Beckwith's clover, but it's got kind of an extension of the stem beyond here with a little um, propeller cap look to it. And none of those are very common, so I didn't really include them. So let me take a look at the, um, is clover popular to come up after fires? Uh, some of them definitely are. So one of the really interesting things about doing our fire followers project is we can take a look at, um, you know, what are the common species in the burned area versus the common species overall. And one of the things that we have seen um, is that um, Trifolium wildenovii is twice as common as Trifolium herdum in the burned areas. And so 
um, you know, we'd have to be a little more technical and we are doing that data analysis right now of, you know, what's coming up after fires versus what was there before fires. So really interesting. And I'll talk more um, about that project after, after I'm done talking about clovers. So I talked, I, this is a great segue into the location question. Um, so sometimes where you are will help to tell you what your clover might be. And that also comes down to the habitat. Um, so not just where in the state are you, but you know what kind of habitat are you in? And there are a couple of clovers that look similar to, there are a couple of non-native clovers that look similar to native clovers, but you'll generally only see them in disturbed areas. And subterranean clover is very common. Um, the key break is really unhelpful as I learned when I was um, you know, going through some clover keying with uh, some interns and they kind of skipped over the, the key break that had subterranean clover in it because they didn't have fruit. So the fruit becomes bristly and it buries itself and that's super distinctive except it buries itself and you don't see it. So you grab, you know, you grab this and you have very few flowers and generally you get trifolium monanthum, which is carpet clover. Um, so a couple of really great things to look at here. Most often when I see subterranean clover, I'm in a disturbed area, but I also see these like red rings around the, the calyx tube. And then the lobes are actually really thin and plumose. Whereas in monanthum, you see sometimes some red spotting, but the calyx lobes are just, they're simple. There's a little bit of hairiness, but not this overall fuzziness that you see in subterranean clover. So most of the time you will see carpet clover um, off in the wilds, not generally in disturbed areas. Trifolium areocephalum, hairy head clover, and trifolium repens, kind of similar, except um, hairy head clover is, is not that common in the state. It grows in far Northern California and into Oregon, but I've seen it and it's kind of cool looking and I really like it. So I want to put it in the show. Um, long clover, I think a lot of us know it, but haven't really looked at it very much. So um, would be a great one if you wanted to learn the key to run it through. I always find it really helpful when I'm trying to learn a new genus is to pick a plant that I already know what it is and run it through the key um, to see, oh, that's what they mean when they say bracts or that's what they mean when they say reflexed. Oh, when they're talking about the calyx, they mean the entire thing, the lobes and the tube together. So, um, Trifolium repens, kind of that long clover that you see all over the place, but not necessarily limited to disturbed areas. Sometimes we'll be growing in areas that are not as disturbed. It's not as common as Trifolium herdum. Um, the flowers are white to start with, but they do fade pink and reflex when they're aging. The leaves often have that white chevron pattern. It's not limited to this clover, but is um, something that might tell you that you've got repens and not areocephalum. Oration, the yellow and golden clovers. So hop clover, little hop clover, golden clover. Um, hop clover and little hop clover are both extremely common in California. You will see them within and away from disturbed areas. They're both non-native. They both have pinnately compound leaves, which you will not notice unless you're looking for it. They just look like regular clover leaves, but there's a little extra um, bink in the, the center part of the stem there and that rachis and all. I have a better picture of that later. But to tell hop from little hop, generally it's the number of flowers. So they both have pinnately compound leaves. The flowers tend to keep these striations in them in hop clover and you have more than 20 flowers generally. So I start counting and then I stop when I get to 20 and I know that I have hop clover. Little hop clover flowers, usually five to 10, sometimes more than that, but not very often. They will fade and reflect and age. Both of these will reflect and age, but you can see that they don't like retain this puffy stripiness. Um, they'll just kind of fold down and get paler. Golden clover, very much like um, hop clover, except the leaves are palmately compound. And then they're, they start out this bright, bright yellow and they retain that stripiness and they fade a little bit, but they're always gonna be more golden than hop clover. Um, so very uncommon in California. I think maybe there are like five to 10 records in the state. 
um, so you probably won't come across it, but if you do, you'll know what it is. Um, Butte County Golden Clover. So Butte County Golden Clover does not reflect like these other non-native clovers. This is a native clover. Um, it will inflate instead, and it's got that golden color to it, much like Orium, um, but you can really tell the difference. So um, you might mistake it for Fucatum, but you can see that the way that it inflates and the color that it is and the length of the flower, it's got much shorter flowers and a much larger involucre than um, Trifolium Fucatum, the bull clover. I did also want to give a shout out to a non trifolium which is Metacago, because that one also has these pinnately compound leaves. You can see it here, leaflet, leaflet, leaflet. And then there's a little bit of extension of the stem in between these leaflets, these pair here, and this one here. And that's what makes it pinnately compound and not palmately compound. But the other things I wanted to point out about that, um, the stipules, so very um, toothy in a Metacago, much like the, the fruit is. Um, most of you know that fruit, that coiled and, um, and barbed fruit. They're not always, but mostly you'll see Metacago polymorpha, which has that characteristic um, coiled flute. Fruit, not flute. Um, and then you can look at the flowers here and see how reflexed the banner is. And then look at this little hop clover, which you might mistake it for because it's got few flowers, um, and see that the the um, the banner is folded in and slightly pointed as opposed to reflexed and notched in burr clover. And then you can also see that it doesn't reflex. All right. More weedy clovers. Um, so Trifolium hardum, I've mentioned it a lot. It is, you know, kind of the most common non-native clover. I see this out in grasslands a lot and not limited to disturbed areas. Um, I usually see uh, trifolium repens in wetter spots and, and rose clover doesn't seem to have that limitation. So it's fairly large and sprawling as far as clovers go. Um, those pink flowers with the long banners, these plumos, like super plumos calyx lobes atop this kind of candy striped stipule, that is an instant for herdum. So, um, even after it's long past flowering, you'll still see that candy stripe and the plumose calyx lobes, and you'll be able to tell that it's trifolium herdum. Um, trifolium pretense, kind of similar, but not as fuzzy, either in the calyx or in the leaves. You see the, um, the leaflets are a different shape. They're much more um, elongated and pointed as opposed to the sort of like clover shaped. And then the, um, the flower color is darker. The calyx lobes are sparsely plumose as opposed to densely plumose. Um, and it's much less common. So I don't think I've ever seen a red clover in the wild. I have seen a lot of narrow leaf clover though. It's becoming much more common, um, particularly in grassland situations. The flowers are not that showy. They are pink when they are flowering. They fade pretty quickly and you get these really plumose calyx lobes and this extended inflorescence and it kind of resembles a grass, particularly because the leaflets are so narrow um, that it does often get mistaken for grass. So when I'm going through and identifying um, Poaceae, I'll, I'll sometimes get um, Trichopolium and Gustafolium in, um, in that grouping in iNaturalist. And then I've seen crimson clover, which if it's flowering, it's pretty easy to tell, like that crimson color is um, kind of unmistakable. It's, you see it often in like cover crop and seed mixes. It will occasionally escape. Um, I think I found it under a pg e power line and they probably brought it in on something. Um, so don't see it that often, but when you do see it, you'll know it. And I'm gonna pause for a minute because this section is hard. The plumose purple and white clovers. Um, we used to live in a time when you could just call it Alba purpureum and you were fine. And it was Rancheria clover. Um, so Tomcat clover, kind of the standard for the pink, purple, and white with the involucre. Um, Rancheria clover is kind of the most common clover, no involucre, plumose calyx lobes, white-tipped purple flowers. 
So the way that you tell Rancheria clover, some of these other clovers, is that the flowers will just barely to not exceed the calyx, which is eight millimeters, less than eight millimeters overall. So here is the tip of the calyx lobe. Here is the tip of the flower. They are the same length. Um, Trifolium dicotomum or dichotomum, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Branched clover, um, again, purplish with white tips. The calyx lobes are um, greater than the tube, which is standard for this group. Um, once considered a variety of allopurpureum, and overall it's really similar, but the flowers will exceed that calyx that's less than eight millimeters. So um, there's a little bit of difference in the leaves, but the leaves are also pretty variable. So um, really flower length compared to calyx um, and the calyx length as well, important to know. Um, olive clover, which um, is called Olivaceum in I naturalist and Columbinum in the Jepson E flora, um, also considered a variety once of Albopurpureum, now elevated. The flowers are much smaller than the calyx, and the calyx is more than eight millimeters in this one. So if you have a calyx that's less than eight millimeters and the flower is less than it, it's probably Rancheria. If, um, but it's really dramatic how much less, how much smaller the flowers are than the calyx in olive clover. Um, and you have to be careful to know if you were just catching it at a really early time um, and the flowers are gonna, like they're just in bud. Um, but generally, if you see it and it looks like this, um, it's probably not um, Rancheria clover. Uh, McRae's clover or double-headed clover, um, really interesting. This is one of the clovers like Trifolium herdum that is sessile, like sits right atop um, a leaf or two leaves. Um, and you can see the stipule here, not an involucre, but a stipule or leaf, like leaf base. Um, the flowers, sometimes all purple, but generally um, purplish with pale tips. And the calyx lobes are again, greater than the tube and they're plumose. And the flowers, um, not to barely exceeding the less than eight millimeter calyx. So similar to Allopurpureum, except this like, one to two heads, oh, sorry, paired heads above one to two leaves. Um, there is another clover in this section of the key um, that's a comparatively large flower robust annual. Um, two fork clover, uh, much larger flowers endemic to the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, looks a little more like this, but much, much more robust and with much more rounded leaflets. That's kind of through our whirlwind tour of the clovers. I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the little things. And one of those is, you know, we think about the clovers again having these um, palmate leaves, um, compound leaves with three leaflets. And so there are four species, um, five taxa of clovers. They're really uncommon. They have more than three leaflets. Um, somebody did see um, Trifolium macrocephalum, which is this one here, super cool looking clover, but more than three leaflets um, in the burn area. So that's great. Um, and then owl's clover, Castilea has very different leaves and very different flowers. It is not a clover. Burr clover, which is this over here. Um, you can see pretty clearly the compound leaflet. Um, this, wait, this is not a Medicago, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is the pinnate leaf of um, Trifolium dubium. I don't know why I said Medicago, but we talked about the Medicago earlier and we saw it. Um, and then wood sorrel, which is this one down below. This is not a clover. It gets mistaken for a clover a lot. It's helpful if you have flowers. Um, this one, it's just like a straight up five petal flower. I'm sure a lot of you know sourgrass or Bermuda buttercup, Oxalis pest capre, um, pretty common weedy species. I find that there is a different look to the Oxalis leaves. They're um, definitely this really strong heart shape and they tend to fold, the leaflets tend to fold down and in. Um, and I find that clover leaflets fold up and in. So it's kind of a subtle difference, but it's there. 
Um, and if you look at enough of them, you'll probably pick up on it. Okay, timing. Timing is everything. Um, so when and where can yield who and what? So your bloom period, your geography and habitat cues, all also important in identifying clovers. So hopefully by now you know that this is Trifolium wildenovii, the tomcat clover. You got the pink banner, you got the purple base with the white tip wings, you got the linear leaflets, um, and you know that I love to talk about it. So why wouldn't I put another picture in? And then Trifolium variegatum, overall very similar, but that really strong purple base white tip. Um, and then this is clammy clover again um, with the really cut calyx and really um, glandular calyx. So what are some other differences? This is from iNaturalist. This is just um, a chart of the seasonality of observations. So mostly you'll find them in early April. That's when you find the most of them. And that's usually when they're flowering is when people notice them. You look at um, the standard Schnauzer variegated clover and you know generally the same timing, much fewer of them. And then looking at clammy clover, you get the peak in between May and June. And so that's another cue and then another one in the late the later part of the year. So um, clammy clover tends to grow in these wetter areas that don't dry out. Um, these will grow in wet meadows, um, but they're usually dried out by May. And so they gotta, you know, they gotta get their thing on earlier. All right. So where do you start in identifying clovers? Well, first you come to this webinar. Um, so unknown IDs. Um, taking pictures, having something for scale, um, focusing on the flower. So getting that top side here, that underside here, so we can see the involucre. You can see the leaves here with that kind of white with purple spotting. Um, there are other photos in this observation um, of the overall, like of the overall plant and the habitat, um, and then generally like the know your location piece is pretty easy with smartphones nowadays. So recognizing similarities to known plants and then using Calflora and or iNaturalist to explore the species that look like it until you find a good match. And then I usually go to the eFlora, I read a description of the plant, I look at more photos. If I'm uncomfortable with it at all, I go back and I start over. Um, so with this one, this is what it looks like on um, iNaturalist, you have your observation, and then if you pick Trifolium, you'll get a little compare button. And when you click that compare button, it'll show you in order of what are the most common clovers that have been observed in the place where you are generally, it defaults to county. You can, um, you can change the default, which is um, by how common it is, to taxonomy, which I don't find super useful when I'm actually in the genus, um, but is super useful when I'm doing something like maybe I just know that it's in the P family um, or it's in, um, you know, it's, it's in the Aster ACE and I wanna look, um, I wanna look by taxonomy and then it's, then that's super useful. Um, in Calflora, you can go to the main page and you can type in Trifolium and you can pick the county where you are in Marin, where you can go to what grows here and be a little more fine with it. Um, and it will give you back a list that's generally more inclusive. Um, it'll have the subspecies listed out. It's got three photos instead of two, um, but it is in alphabetical order. Um, so if you are looking at like, oh, I know it's in the ABAC. Um, you get back like, you know, 280 matches for your county. That can be a little, um, a little tricky as well. Um, and then you can just kind of scroll through the photos. I didn't talk about rabbit's foot, photo because, rabbit's foot clover because I don't like it. Um, uh, but then you can kind of like go through those and then do the, do the matching. Um, and then you can go to the eFlora. So with this one, you know, I talked about the two groups a lot, the involucre bracts generally fused, um, more than one millimeter copper bull, 
inflorescence not sessile, and then involucre bracts zero, sometimes in a ring, sometimes the inflorescence is sessile, that's group two. So we're definitely in group one here. You can see the involucral bracts on this clover. We know that it's inflated. Um, we know that it's not hairy. And then um, I will show you the observation. So here you can see I have more photos, one with a ruler. So I know how big my flowers are, which is great. Um, and then I know that it's trifolium fucatum because of the size of the flowers. But I would also know that from the color of the flowers. Um, and, you know, it can be really hard, particularly with fucatum and depauperatum, to tell them apart in flowers. So um, you can try and use cues like how big are the leaves in comparison to the flowers, but that gets pretty tr tricky pretty quickly. Um, another great way to, um, if you're going to be spending a lot of time with a group of plants, is to make a table like this, where you write down the, um, the important characters and how each of them differs. So I did this for um, Ceanothus when I started up, at, um, up on Mount Tan, because I really had very little experience with that group. Um, you know, I came from up north where there's like very few kinds and um, came into a place where there were tons of them and some of them were rare and um, I felt it was hard to tell them apart and then I just like made the list. And same thing with the clovers here, you've got, you know, okay, all of these are inflated in fruit um, and all of them are native except uh, this is strawberry clover here. So you can see the three types of trifolium depauperatum here. You can see the trifolium fucatum, this one has that um, cream color with the dark spots. Um, and you can see kind of side by side the differences in these two. Um, so that's another great way to do it. And then if folks are interested in, um, in getting this, then just like let us know afterwards and I can send you a copy of that. It's got more, um, more clovers as well. So, wanted to talk a little bit about um, fire followers. And um, I don't know, Jose, can I put you on the spot to talk about it? Because I feel like I need to drink even more. My voice is going to fade away. Yeah, cool? yeah, I can give yeah. you a little break right now. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Jose Esparza. I'm the community science coordinator at CNPS. And uh, I just want to talk a little bit about the California fire followers. Uh, so uh, essentially, uh, for those that don't know, uh, the California Fire Followers Project is a community science project that um, essentially uh, looks to uh, looks at the responses of plants um, following um, the wildfires. Uh, we started out with the 2020 Fire Followers Project, and uh, we now uh, extended that, and we also have the 2021 Fire Followers Project. Uh, one looks at the fires from 2020 and the other looks at the wildfires from 2021. Uh, and the project essentially looks to do uh, three things, right? Uh, one is changing the language around wildfires. Uh, two, um, to in sort of activate and uh, engage um, people in community science. And then uh, three is to compare uh, plants seen uh, both before and after fires, increase in understanding of fire followers and provide uh, crucial information on species of concern to aid in like recovery and conservation efforts. And um, essentially how to get started, uh, pretty much laid out here on this slide. Um, if you actually go to our website, uh, cnps.org forward slash fire dash followers, um, it'll tell you essentially how to get started, how to sign up on iNaturalist um, and it has some really great tips on like know, know before you go um, to how to explore some of the burn sites uh, before heading out, knowing some of the safety. Um, it also uh, takes you through like a tutorial on how to um, get involved with iNaturalist. And um, yeah, so uh, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, email me. Um, my email should be, um, well, I'll, I'll put it in the chat. Great, thanks. Um, and I see a note in the chat um, 
that old world clovers like red um, for tents or uh, white like tripolium or pens are fragrant um, and that uh, if it is Vernon, um, then he can detect fragrance from the gatum. Um, and if it's Doreen, hi Doreen, well hi Vernon anyway. Um, and thanks for that. Um, that's really helpful. I have never detected a fragrance from variegatum, but maybe I just didn't smell close enough. Um, I have smelled um, repens. It smells like, you know, like you would imagine that the flower that you get clover had smells like. So um, that's great. And then clovers um, are nitrogen fixers. They will bring um, nitrogen to the foil soil. They're great for bees, um, bumblebees, and um, other native bees, but also honeybees in particular love um, tripolium repens. So really valuable um, early blooming wildflowers. And they're, I mean, they're just, they're great. I like them. Um, a lot of them are rare. I mentioned quite a few, excuse me. I mentioned quite a few rare clovers um, today. And if you are interested in seeing some of those clovers or possibly, um, you know, stewarding some of them going out and um, kind of adopting them, monitoring their status. If you're in an area that has rare clovers, you can um, join the hunt and do a rare plant treasure hunt. Um, we have information up on our website and um, you can email Jose and he can get you in touch with Amy Patton, who's our rare plant treasure hunt coordinator um, and you know, help out in um, directly looking for some of these rare species. We are seeing a lot of rare species come up after fire. And so you could also like combine the two and go looking for clovers. And um, if you need help identifying plants on iNaturalist, just at me, I'm Boshniakia on iNat. Um, and that's kind of the end of my presentation. I have a little time maybe um, to talk about, oh, I don't, oh my gosh, it's seven o'clock. I've been talking for an hour about um, about clovers, which, you know, apparently is easy for me. Um, hi, Doreen, I'm, I'm super glad you could make it tonight. Um, so anybody else have other questions, comments about clovers? iNaturalist, Calflora, fire followers, um, rare plant treasure hunts. Any advice for monitoring Buckwest? Ooh, it's a good question. Um, email me and I will talk more with you about it. Um, it's It can be hard. Yeah, uh, it's a really involved thing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I don't know. I don't know it well enough to give you advice um, right off the bat. This recording will be available to rewatch. I'm happy to get the presentation out to folks. Um, so um, email Jose and he can, um, he can help coordinate that. And we might just, I don't know, we'll talk about um, if we just wanna send it out to everybody, um, what types of clover are fav favorite for native bees. I have not seen a clover that is unpopular with our native bees. So um, I would encourage you to plant clovers that will bloom throughout the season if you have the habitat for it. And you can go to calscape.org um, and see what clovers are good for planting in your area and the bloom season. So early season bloomers and late season bloomers are generally the hardest for bees to find. And um, it's great to have those available in your yard. So sometimes people will plant like manzanita and rye bees because they're blooming in January, when a lot of the bumblebee queens are just emerging and getting their nests set up for the season, and then late in the season, um, you know, when they're when they're um, kind of ending the year, um, you can kind of prolong their their lifespan <laughs> essentially, like prolong how how long they're able to survive by planting some of the later blooming species. And some of the clovers are pretty late blooming, so um, that's my that's my little spiel on native bees. And I think I 
we put, I'll put, I mean, calscape.org is a pretty easy. All right, great. Well,